The Lives of the Saints, by the Reverend Alban Butler, taken from the 4th edition, published in 1954. October 11th, Saints Tarachus, Probus, and Andronicus, all martyrs. The holy name of God was glorified by the triumph of these martyrs in the persecution of Diocletian at Anazarbus in Sicilia, probably in the year 304, when the edicts against the Christians were made general and extended to all the laity without exception. Their acts are a precious monument of ecclesiastical antiquity. The three first parts contain the triple examination which the saints underwent at Tarsus, Mopsuestia, and Anazarbus, three cities in Cilicia, and are an authentic copy of the consular register, which certain Christians purchased by, of the public notaries for the sum of 200 denarii, upwards of six pounds sterling. The last part was added by Marcion, Felix, and Verus, three Christians who were present at the martyrdom, and afterwards stole the bodies from the guards and interred them, resolving to spend the remainder of their lives near the place and after their deaths to be buried in the same vault with them. The three martyrs were joined in the confession of the same faith but differed in their age and countries. Tarachus was a Roman by extraction, though born in Asaria. He had served in the army, but had procured his discharge for fear of being compelled to do something that was contrary to the duty of a Christian. He was at that time 65 years old. Probus, a native of Pamphylia, had resigned a considerable fortune that he might be more at liberty to serve Christ. Andronicus was a young nobleman of one of the principal families of the city of Ephesus. Being apprehended at Pompeiopolis in Cilicia, they were presented to Numerian Maximus, governor of the province, upon his arrival in that city, and by his order were conducted to Tarsus, the metropolis, to wait his return. Maximus, being arrived there and seated on his tribunal, Demetrius the centurion brought them before him, saying they were the persons who had been presented to him at Pompeiopolis for professing the impious religion of the Christians and disobeying the command of the emperors. Maximus addressed himself first to Tarachus, observing that he began with him because he was advanced in years, and then asked his name. Tarachus replied, I am a Christian. Speak not of thy impiety, but tell me thy name. I am a Christian. Strike him upon the mouth, and bid him not answer one thing for another. Tarachus, after receiving a buffet on his jaws, said, I tell you my true name. If you would know that which my parents gave me, it is Tarachus. When I bore arms, I went by the name of Victor. What is thy profession, and, what of, and of what country art thou? I am of a Roman family, and was born at Claudiopolis in Isaria. I am by profession a soldier, but quitted the service upon the account of my religion. In consideration of thy gray hairs, I will procure thee the favor and friendship of the emperors, if thou wilt obey their orders. Draw near and sacrifice to the gods, as the emperors themselves do all the world over. They are deceived by the devil in so doing. Break his jaws for saying the emperors are deceived. I repeat it, as men they are deluded. Sacrifice to our gods and renounce thy folly. I cannot renounce the law of God. Is there any law, wretch, but that which we obey? There is, and you transgress it by adoring stocks and stones, the works of men's hands. Strike him on the face, saying, Abandon thy folly. What, will you, call, what you call folly is the salvation of my soul and I will never leave it. But I will make thee leave it, and force thee to be wise. Do with my body what you please. It is entirely in your power. Then Maximus said, Strip him and beat him with rods. Tarachus, when beaten, said, You have now made me truly wise. I am strengthened by your blows, and my confidence in God and in Jesus Christ is increased. Wretch! How canst thou deny a plurality of gods when, according to thy own confession, thou servest two gods? Didst thou not give the name of God to a certain person named Christ? Right, for this is the Son of the living God. He is the hope of the Christians and the author of salvation to such as suffer for his sake. Forbear this idle talk, draw near, and sacrifice. I am no idle talker. I am sixty-five years old. Thus have I been brought up and I cannot forsake the truth. Let him be loaded with chains and carried back to prison. Bring forth the next in years. Demetrius the centurion said, He is here, my lord. What is his name? 
My chief and most honorable name is Christian, but the name I go by in the world is Probus. Of what country art thou, and of what family? My, na- my father was of Thrace. I am a plebeian born at Sida in Pamphylia, and profess Christianity. That will do thee no service. Be advised by me, sacrifice to the gods, that thou mayest be honored by the emperors and enjoy my friendship. I want nothing of that kind. Formerly, I was possessed of a considerable estate, but I relinquished it to serve the living God through Jesus Christ. Take off his garments, gird him, lay him at his full length, and lash him with with ox's sinews. Demetrius the centurion said to him, whilst they were beating him, Spare thyself, my friend. See how thy blood runs and streams on the ground. Do what you will with my body. Your torments are sweet perfumes to me. Is this thy obstinate folly incurable? What canst thou hope for? I am wiser than you are, because I do not worship devils. Turn him and strike him on the belly. Lord, assist thy servant. Ask him at every stripe, where is thy helper? He helps me and will help me, for I take so little notice of your torments that I do not obey you. Look, wretch, upon thy mingled body. The ground is covered with thy blood. The more my body suffers for Jesus Christ, the more is my soul refreshed. Put fetters on his hands and feet, with his legs distended in the stocks to the fourth hole, and let nobody come to dress his wounds. Bring the third to the bar. Demetrius the centurion said, Here he stands, my lord. What is his name? What is thy name? My true name is Christian, and the name by which I am commonly known among men is Andronicus. What is your family? My father is one of the first rank in Ephesus. Adore the gods and obey the emperors who are our fathers and masters. The devil is your father whilst you do his works. Youth makes you insolent. I have torments ready. I am prepared for whatever may happen. Strip him naked. Gird him and stretch him on the rack. Demetrius the centurion said to the martyr, Obey, my friend, before thy body is torn and mangled. It is better for me to have my body tormented than to lose my soul. Sacrifice before I put thee to the most cruel death. I have never sacrificed to demons from my infancy, and I will not now begin. Wretch, art thou insensible to torments? Thou dost not yet know what it is to suffer fire and razors. When thou hast felt them, thou wilt perhaps give over thy folly. This folly is expedient for us who hope in Jesus Christ. Earthly wisdom leads to eternal death. Tear his limbs with the utmost violence. I have done no evil, yet you torment me like a murderer. I contend for that piety which is due to the true God. If thou hadst but the least sense of piety, thou wouldst adore the gods whom the emperors so religiously worship. It is not piety, but impiety to abandon the true God and to adore brass and marble. Execrable execrable villain, are then the emperors guilty of impieties? Hoist him again and gore his sides. I am in your hands. Do with my body what you please. Lay salt upon his wounds and rub his sides with broken tiles. Your torments have refreshed my body. I will cause thee to die gradually. Your menaces do not terrify me. My courage, above all, is above all that your malice can invent. Put a heavy chain about his neck and another upon his legs and keep him in close prison. Thus ended the first examination. The second was held at Mopsuestia, Flavius Clemens Numeranius Maximus, governor of Cilicia, sitting on his tribunal, said to Demetrius the centurion, Bring forth the impious wretches who follow the religion of the Christians. Demetrius said, Here they are, my lord. Maximus said to Tarakus, Old age is respected in many on account of the good sense and prudence that generally attend it. Wherefore, if you have made proper use of the time allowed you for reflection, I presume your own discretion has wrought in you a change of sentiments, as a proof of which it is required that you sacrifice to the gods, which cannot fail of recommending you to the esteem of your superiors. I am a Christian, 
and I wish you and the emperors would leave your blindness and embrace the truth which leads to life. Break his jaws with a stone, and bid him leave off his folly. This folly is true wisdom. Now they have loosened all thy teeth, wretch. Take pity on thyself. Come to the altar and sacrifice to the gods to prevent severer treatment. Though you cut my body into a thousand pieces, you will not be able to shake my resolution, because it is Christ who gives me strength to stand my ground. Wretch, accursed by the gods, I will find means to drive out thy folly. Bring in a pan of burning coals, and hold his hands in the fire till they are burnt. I fear not your temporal fire, which soon passes, but I dread eternal flames. See thy hands are well baked, they are consumed by the fire, is it not time for thee to grow wise? Sacrifice! If you have any other torments in store for me, employ them. I hope I shall be able to withstand all your attacks. Hang him by the feet with his head over a great smoke. After having proved an overmatch for your fire, I am not afraid of your smoke. Bring vinegar and salt and force them up his nostrils. Your vinegar is sweet to me and your salt insipid. Put mustard into the vinegar and thrust it up his nose. Your ministers impose upon you. They have given me honey instead of mustard. Enough for the present. I will make it my business to invent fresh tortures to bring thee to thy senses. I will not be baffled. You will find me prepared for the attack. Away with him to the dungeon. Bring in another. Demetrius, the centurion, said, My lord... Here is Probus. Well, Probus, hast thou considered the matter, and art thou disposed to sacrifice to the gods after the example of the emperors? I appear here again with fresh vigor. The torments I have endured have hardened my body, and my soul is strengthened in her courage and proof against all you can inflict. I have a living God in heaven, him I serve and adore, and no other. What? Villain, are not ours living gods? Can stones and wood, the workmanship of a statuary, be living gods? You know not what you do when you sacrifice to them. What insolence! At least sacrifice to the great god Jupiter. I will excuse you as to the rest. Do not you blush to call him God who was guilty of adulteries, incests, and other most enormous crimes? Beat his mouth with a stone and bid him not blaspheme. Why this evil treatment? I have spoken no worse of Jupiter than they do who serve him. I utter no lie. I speak the truth, as you yourself well know. Heat bars of iron and apply them to his feet. This fire is without heat. At least I feel none. Hoist him on the rack and let him be scourged with thongs of raw leather till his shoulders are flayed. All this does me no harm. Invent something new, and you will see the power of God who is in me and strengthens me. Shave his head, and lay burning coals upon it. You have burnt my head and my feet. You see, notwithstanding, that I still continue God's servant, and disregard your torments. He will save me. Your gods can only destroy. Beat his face, that he may learn to say the gods and not God. You unjustly destroy my mouth, and disfigure my face, because I speak the truth. I will also cause thy blasphemous tongue to be plucked out to make thee comply. Besides the tongue which serves me for utterance, I have an internal and immortal tongue which is out of your reach. Take him to prison. Let the third come in. Demetrius the centurion said, He is here. Your companions, Adronicus, were at first obstinate, but gained nothing thereby but torments and disgrace, and have been at last compelled to obey. They shall receive considerable recompenses. Therefore, to escape the like torments, sacrifice to the gods, and thou shalt be honored accordingly. But if thou refusest, I swear by the immortal gods and by the invincible emperors that thou shalt not escape out of my hands with thy life. Why do you endeavor to deceive me with lies? They have not renounced the true God. And had that been so, you should never find me guilty of such an impiety. Bind him to the stakes and scourge him with raw thongs. There is nothing new or extraordinary in this torment. The clerk, Athanasius, said, Thy whole body is but one wound from head to foot, 
And dost thou count this nothing? They who love the living God make very small account of all this. Rub his back with salt. Give orders, I pray you, that they do not spare me, that being well seasoned, I may be in no danger of putrefaction, and may be the better able to withstand your torments. Turn him and beat him upon the belly to open afresh his first wounds. You saw, when I was brought last before your tribunal, how I was perfectly cured of the wounds I received by the first day's tortures. He that cured me then can cure me a second time. Maximus, addressing himself to the guards of the prison, Villains and traitors, said he, did I not strictly forbid you to suffer anyone to see them or dress their wounds? Yet see here. Senseless man, the physician that has healed me is no less powerful than he is tender and charitable. You know him not. He cures not by the application of medicines, but by his word alone. Thou, he d- Though he dwells in heaven, he is present everywhere, but you know him not. My authority shall not be baffled by thee, nor shall it ever be said that the cause of Jesus Christ is vanquished by your authority. Let me have several kinds of tortures in readiness against my next sitting. Put this man in prison, loaded with chains, and let no one be admitted to visit them in the dungeons. The third examination was held at Anatsopus. In it, Tarakas answered first with his usual constancy, saying to all threats that a speedy death would finish his victory and complete his happiness, and that long torments would procure him the greater recompense. When Maximus had caused him to be bound and stretched on the rack, he said, I could allege the, rece- the rescript of Diocletian, which forbids judges to put military men to the rack, but I waive my privilege lest you should suspect me of cowardice. Do what you please with my body, not only whilst it is living, but also after my death. Maximus ordered his lips, cheeks, and whole face to be slashed and cut. Tarakus said, You have disfigured my face, but have added new beauty to my soul. I fear not any of your inventions, for I am clothed with the divine honor, armor. The tyrant ordered spits to be heated and applied red hot to his armpits, then his ears to be cut off, at which the martyr said, My heart will not be less attentive to the word of God. Maximus said, Tear the skin off his head, then cover it with burning coals. Tarakus replied, Though you should order my whole body to be flayed, you will not be able to separate me from my God. Apply the red-hot spits once more to his armpits and sides. O God of heaven, look down upon me and be my judge. The governor then sent him back to prison to be reserved for the public shows the day following, and called for the next. Probus being brought forth, Maximus again exhorted him to sacrifice, but after many words ordered him to be bound and hung up by the feet. Then red-hot spits to be applied to his sides and back. Probus said, My body is in your power. May the Lord of heaven and earth vouchsafe to consider my patience and the humility of my heart. The God whom thou implorest has delivered thee into my hands. He loves men. Open his mouth and pour in some of the wine which has been offered upon the altars, and thrust some of the sanctified meat into his mouth. See, O Lord, the violence they offer me, and judge my cause. Now thou seest that after suffering a thousand torments rather than to sacrifice, thou hast nevertheless partook of a sacrifice. You have done no great feat in making me taste these abominable offerings against my will. No matter, it is now done. Promise now to do it voluntarily, and thou shalt be released. God forbid that I should yield. But know that if you should force me into all abominable offerings of your whole altars, I should be no no ways defiled, for God sees the violence which I suffer. Heat the spits again, and burn the calves of his legs with them. Then he said to Probus, there is not a second part, not a sound part in thy whole body, and still thou persistest in thy folly. Wretch, what canst thou hope for? I have abandoned my whole body over to you, that my soul may remain whole and sound. Make some sharp nails red hot and pierce his hands with them. O my Savior, I return you most hearty thanks that you have been pleased to make me share in your own sufferings. The great number of thy torments make thee more foolish. Would to God your soul was not blind and in darkness. Now thou hast lost the use of all thy members. Thou complainest of me for not having deprived thee of thy sight. Prick him in the eyes, but by little and little, till you have bored out the organs of his sight. 
Behold, I am now blind. Thou hast destroyed the eyes of my body, but canst not take away those of my soul. Thou continuest still to argue, but thou art condemned to eternal darkness. Did you know the darkness in which your soul is plunged? You would see yourself much more miserable than I am. What? Dost thou hope to survive these torments? Canst thou flatter thyself that I shall allow thee one moment's respite? I expect nothing from you but a cruel death, and I ask of God only the grace to persevere in the confession of his holy name to the end. I will leave thee to languish as such an impious wretch deserves. Take him hence. Let the prisoners be closely guarded that none of their friends who would congratulate with them may find access. I design them for the shows. Let Andronicus be brought in. He is the most resolute of the three. The governor pressed Andronicus again to comply, adding that his two companions had at length sacrificed to the gods and to the emperors themselves. The martyr replied, This is truly the part of an adorer of gods whom they serve. May God judge you, O worker of iniquity. Maximus ordered rolls of paper to be made and set on fire upon the belly of the martyr, then bodkins to be heated and laid red hot betwixt his fingers. Finding him still unshaken, he said to him, Do not expect to die at once. I will keep thee alive till the time of the shows, that thou mayest behold thy limbs devoured one after another by cruel beasts. Andronicus answered, You are more inhuman than the tigers, and more insatiable with blood than the most bar barbarous murderers. Open his mouth, and put some of the sanctified meat into it, and pour some of the wine into it which hath been offered to the gods. Behold, O Lord, the violence which is offered me. What wilt thou do now? Thou hast tasted of the offerings taken from the altar. Thou art now initiated in the mysteries of the gods. Know, tyrant, that the soul is not defiled when she suffers involuntarily what she condemns. God, who sees the secrets of hearts, knows that mine has not consented to this abomination. How long will this frenzy delude thy imagination? It will not deliver thee out of my hands. God will deliver me when he pleases. This is fresh extravagance. I will cause that tongue of thine to be cut out to put an end to thy praying, to thy, to thy prating. I ask it as a favor that those lips and tongue with which you imagine I have concurred in partaking of the meats and wine offered to idols may be cut off. Pluck out his teeth and cut out his blasphemous tongue to the very root, burn them, and then scatter the ashes in the air that none of his impious companions or of the women may be able to gather them up to keep as something precious or holy. Let him be carried to his dungeon to serve for food to the wild beasts in the amphitheater. The trial continued of the three martyrs being thus concluded. Maximus sent for Terentianus, the ciliarch or pontiff and first magistrate of the community in Cilicia, who had the care of the public games and spectacles, and gave him orders to exhibit a public show the next day. In the morning, a prodigious multitude, multitude of people flocked to the amphitheater, which was a mile distant from the town of Anatsibus. The governor came thither about noon. The governor at length sent some of his guards to bring the Christians whom he had sentenced to the beasts. The martyrs were in so piteous a condition by their torments that, far from being able to walk, they could not so much as stir their mangled bodies. But they were carried on the backs of porters and thrown down in the pit of the amphitheater, below the seat of the governor. No sooner were the martyrs laid down, but an almost universal deep silence followed at the sight of such dismal objects, and the people began openly to murmur against the governor for his barbarous cruelty. Many even left the shows and returned to the city, which provoked the governor, and he ordered more so soldiers to guard all the avenues to stop any from departing, and to take notice of all who attempted it, that they might be afterwards called to their trial by him. At the same time, he commanded a great number of beasts to be let loose out of their dens into the pit. These fierce creatures rushed out, but all stopped near the doors of their lodges, and would not advance to hurt the martyrs. Maximus in a fury called for the keepers, and caused one hundred strokes with cudgels to be given them, making them responsible for the tameness of their lions and tigers, because they were less cruel than himself. He threatened even to crucify them, unless they let out the most ravenous of their beasts. They turned out a great bear, which that very day had killed three men. He walked up slowly towards the martyrs, and began to lick the wounds of Andronicus. That martyr leaned his head on the bearer, and endeavored to provoke him, but in vain. Maximus possessed himself no longer, but ordered the beast to be immediately killed. The bearer received the strokes, and fell quietly before the feet of Andronicus. 
Terencianus, seeing the rage of the governor and trembling for himself, immediately ordered a most furious lioness to be let out. At the sight of her, all the spectators turned pale, and her terrible roarings made the bravest men tremble on their safe seats. Yet, when she came up to the saints, who lay stretched on the sand, she laid herself down at the feet of St. Taracus and licked them, quite forgetting her natural ferocity. Maximus, foaming with rage, commanded her to be pricked with goads. She then arose and raged about in a furious manner, roaring terribly and affrighting all the spectators who, seeing that she had broken down part of the door of her lodge, which the governor had ordered to be shut, cried out earnestly that she might be again driven into her lodge. The governor therefore called for the confectors or gladiators to dispatch the martyrs with their swords, which they did. Maximus commanded the bodies to be intermixed with those of the gladiators who had been slain, and also to be, to be guarded that night by six soldiers, lest the Christians should carry them off. The night was very dark, and a violent storm of thunder and rain dispersed the guards. The faithful distinguished the three bodies by a miraculous star or ray of light which streamed on each of them. They carried off the precious treasures on their backs and hid them in a hollow cave in the neighboring mountains, where the governor was not able by any search he could make to find them. He severely chastised the guards who had abandoned their station. Three fervent Christians, Marcion, Felix, and Verus, retired into this cave of the rock, being resolved to spend there all the remainder of their lives. The governor left Anatsibus three days after. The Christians of that city sent this relation to the church of Iconium, desiring it might be communicated to the faithful of Pisidia and Pamphylia for their edification. The three martyrs finished their glorious course on the 11th of October, on which day their names occur in the Roman and other martyrologies.